What's going on? I'm Fred Kennedy, creator of the comic Dead Romans. Well, not creator. We'll say writer. And you're listening to the True North Country Comics Podcast. Welcome to the True North Country Comics Podcast, dedicated to promote Canadian comic book and graphic novel creators and supporters. I'm John Swinimer. If you want to drop me a line, you can contact me at john at truenorthcountrycomics.com. In celebration of comic book creators exhibiting at Fan Expo Canada 2023, on this episode I chat with Fred Kennedy about his Dead Romans comic book series and more. Fan Expo Canada is the largest comics, sci-fi, horror, anime, and gaming event in Canada and the third largest pop culture event in North America. The show has grown from a small comic book convention, attracting 1,500 fans, into a multifaceted and multiple-day citywide event that attracts hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and YouTube. Please like and subscribe to that video channel. And if you want to help the site and the podcast, please consider supporting the effort by chipping in at ko-fi.com slash True North Country Comics. Your patronage is greatly appreciated. Based in Toronto, Ontario, Fred Kennedy has a varied career as a radio host, a TV personality, and a comic book writer. He cites one of his most memorable career milestones to date as interviewing Weird Al Yankovic. Fred's previous writing credits include the anthology series True Patriot Presents and The Fourth Planet. His latest project, Dead Romans, is illustrated by Nick Marinkovich, lettered by Andrew Thomas, and edited by Alison O'Toole. Dead Romans is a story of Arminius, a Germanic prince raised in Rome who has sworn vengeance against the empire that butchers his people. He wants to make a queen of the woman he loves, Anaria, a fellow slave. Now 50,000 Romans will die to give her a throne she never asked for or wanted. And so, without further ado, here's my chat with Fred Kennedy about his Dead Romans comic book series and more. So, Fred Kennedy, thank you very much for taking time to chat with me. Thank you for giving me some of your time, man. I appreciate it. Before we get started with all the questions, I want to ask you, what was the first comic book that you read? Oh, man. You know, I pr- it was probably an Archie comic. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing was, is I remember this one specific Archie comic, but I can't remember anything about it but the cover. Mm-hmm. And it was like an Archie cover, but it was like Archie as Conan the Barbarian. And I remember thinking that it was going to involve all this like Conan the Barbarian type stuff, but it didn't. And now with all like the Archie horror stuff, there's definitely room for an Archie sword and sandals story. Yes, you know? I, th- I think there's a uh, Canadian uh, writer who would be very interested in doing that. Yeah, yeah, me. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Well, that was that's great inspiration as a youngster, but who or what inspires you to create today? You know, it's funny, like Adam Gorham is like one of my closest friends, and I find him to be one of the most inspirational people that I know and work with. He's like, his output is just insane, and he's still the same guy that I was friends with like 15 years ago. So yeah, like Adam for sure. Allison, Allison O'Toole, our editor. Uh, that I work with on Dead Romans with. She's really, she's, she's great. She's so soft-spoken. She's, I relate to a lot of her takes on things because she's, she's not a confrontational person and she's working as an editor, which is a very confrontational gig. And for her to get through all that stuff, I think is pretty inspiring. Jason Lowe, another guy uh, who had completely given up on comics and was just doing like cosplay as a uh, multiple man for years as part of like this crew called Toronto X-Men who Alison O'Toole was also a part of, by the way, she mm-hmm. was Scarlet Witch in that. And then he just got back into comics with the uh, Piddle for Human Lizard and uh, he's done amazing things. Those are three people that I know sort of top hand, I guess would be inspiring to me. And then there's like the people that have just done amazing things and lived the dream and all that stuff. But I don't know them outside of headlines, so it's hard to say they're inspiring. Although, outside of comics, Arnold Schwarzenegger, love the guy. I do <laughs> love Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I find him to be such a fascinating character. And uh, yeah, those are, the first, those are the first three people I know, 
And then one person who's my all time dream interview right there. Super good stuff. Good stuff. So we're talking under the context of fan expo Canada. So with that in mind, do you have any favorite memories from that convention or other recent conventions? You know, I think fan expo in 2013, I think would be pretty dope. Cause that was the year that we released the trade for Teuton volume three. Mm -hmm. which kind of wrapped that series. And it was memorable because we had so many people coming to our table to get the book. We sold close to a thousand trades that convention. And we were right next to Mike Mignola and Mike (laughs) Mignola. I remember him saying quite bluntly, he goes, I am amazed. I have never seen an indie book at any show sell like this ever. He goes, you're doing this all on your own. And he goes, you've had lineups. We had lineups on par with him most of the week That's because something. we'd been doing that series for like four years and yep. we'd made a big stink about last book of the series. It all ends this weekend. Hmm. And then Adam went on to do amazing things. And it was like, it was bittersweet because like Adam's like one of my best friends. And I was, I'd been working with him for like three, four years on that book. And then he's gone and he's working on all these like big shot, huge books. And, and it was, uh, it was bittersweet in that sense, but it was a cool vibe. And also I, I did just finished the San Diego con last month. Mm-hmm. And I think that is memorable and cool for me because I was at the image table and it felt yep. like a real, like almost like sense of arrival. Mm-hmm. I remember Jimmy Palmiotti saying <laughs> that he had our book and he loved it. That was very surreal. That was a really surreal moment. And then we're sitting at a table and we're signing down the row from Jeff Lemire and Jeff (laughs) Lemire is sending people over to get our book. And it was so kind of him to do that. And meeting Jose Villarubia, who's like our colorist on Dead Romans, who's like an iconic character in comics. And it's funny because when um, Nick was saying, uh, I've got a friend who can do colors for us, my buddy Jose. And I was like, okay, cool, your buddy Jose. And then I get an email And it's like, Jose Villarubia? No. (laughs) And it's like, yeah. So there you go. Like, that was pretty surreal. And and there was just this going to get your badge, and it says Image Comics on the badge. And then sitting at the table. It just was the raddest vibe, man. Like, it was so cool. And I know that there's so many comics. And, like, it's funny. We met Rick Remender. We were signing right after Rick Remender. (laughs) Yeah. And then we like introduced ourselves and we're like, oh, we got our first image book. And there was this, yeah. he was very kind and he was very kind and so funny, but there was a sense of like, it doesn't matter to him. Like being at the show is not what matters to him anymore. And it's like, it shouldn't matter. You know, like I right. get it. It's all about the story, but there, yeah. there still is a sense of this is really cool. And I really liked it. And I don't ever want to lose that feeling that it was magic, you know? Oh, sure. No, it's been like, like I said, man, it's been like 12, 13 years of doing self-publishing and indie stuff to be at that image table was a really cool scene, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now you've hinted at this already in our conversation, but I wanted to ask you what book or books will you be exhibiting at this year's fan expo? It's funny because the day before the show starts, the sixth issue of dead Romans drops. So that wraps the first arc of the book and it gives a nice little button hook ending. It's all wrapped up into a neat little package and it's pretty cool. And, and I think that's a, that's a great setup because the spring show like Toronto comic-con in March happened the weekend before the first issue dropped. Fan expo happens the day after the final issue comes out. The timing is pretty dope. So that's cool. That is. So for people not familiar with the story, and they should be, uh, can you give just a brief overview of what it's about? It takes place during the Battle of the Tudorberg, which is like the worst defeats, the one of the worst defeats the Roman Empire ever suffered. Some want to say it was the worst. In, in terms of scale, definitely not as close as some of the bigger ones like Cannae and all that stuff. Although you could argue it was a republic at that time. Um, so it, it's definitely in the top three or four of scale. But in terms of impact, it really did affect not just the Roman Empire, but the way Western Europe and in turn, most of the world ended up being shaped. Um, And so it's this brutally dark massacre of like 50,000 people over a few days. 
in a boggy, rain-ridden swamp. And we decided, let's put a love story in there. And that is the story Dead Romans right there. There's 50,000 Dead Romans. Now, you, you're typically known for doing fantastical sort of science fiction type stuff. What inspired you to create this particular story? Oh, this is my jam, man. Yeah. I, I and, and even when I was doing like fantastical sci-fi stuff, it was all very much rooted in historical events because I always feel like science fiction is really just a way to look at humanity through the window. I think that's all science fiction ever really is, like analysis of the problems that we face as a society here on Earth just from a different context. And, and a lot of escapism, for sure. You could argue there's a lot of escapism in this story, too. But the historical fiction stuff, like my very first book, Teuton, was sort of historical fantasy incorporating, it, it was almost like sort of a story of the Battle of Troy with the gods fighting alongside the mortals kind of thing, uh, and the demigods, etc. But instead of the Mediterranean set along the Baltic Seas. Whereas this is just like a straight retelling of a historical event. Now, it's got a fictional storyline placed inside as like a story device. But all of the big nuts and bolts of the Battle of Tudorburg are front and center. So I think that anybody who's a fan of history, especially big tentpole events like the Battle of Tudorburg Forest, will really enjoy it. I, I've always found it to be a fascinating story. The character of Arminius separating fact from fiction and who he was and what he managed to achieve. It's pretty impressive. It's definitely one of the most fantastical victories that ever actually happened in human history easily. Okay. Now this, as I said, is based in history. Did you have to do a lot of research for your story? Mm. Yes, but I was very familiar with the story, okay. but I still did all kinds of research on it. Uh, I grew up in Belgium, and um, my interest in Roman history sort of began when I was a kid because we did a field trip, like a Roman architectural dig. And outside of the dig site was this recreated Belgii village, like this tribal village. And they talk about how Julius Caesar fought a big battle right here, and I thought it was really cool. And getting an obelisk and asterisk comic book <laughs> mm -hmm. from my mom, which, you know, that's not historical text, but it really does spark you yes. to be intrigued in that type of thing. And all those, those things really started me on my way with it. From there, you watch all kinds of documentaries. You know, it's interesting because I, I talked about this with my wife the other day because we were talking about our kids watching stupid stuff on YouTube all the time, which if I was a kid their age, I'd do the same thing. <laughs> but when I was a kid, there was no YouTube. Like that yeah. didn't exist. No. And you had one TV. We had this 27 inch Hitachi TV and it was, had, it was the weight 8,000 pounds. <laughs> um, yeah. it, you could heat the basement with the heat that this thing gave off. Yeah. And that was the only TV. And so we just, my dad is a big history buff and he would leave, like History Channel mm -hmm. and Learning Channel when it actually was the Learning Channel and, yep. Haney and all these documentaries. And I remember watching a documentary about uh, the Battle of Tudorburg and not really understanding it. And then there was this book, Publishers Clearinghouse or Time Life Books or something, did this book of like encyclopedias for kids. And they had all these themed books. And one of these themed books was bat Great Battles for Freedom was the idea. And there are stories uh, that took place in Korea, stories that took place in like the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. I remember there was a lot about the revolt, I think with the revolt in Haiti prominently featured in there, but there was also the Tudorburg was in there. And it was this, I and I remember this idea of these like barbarian tribes with like wooden shields and, and rinky dinky spears fighting the great Roman empire, which is kind of glossing over a lot of what happened, oh, yeah. but it, it was a thoroughly interesting story. And I remember reading that in like the sixth grade and I, maybe it all started there. I really don't okay. know. It's hard to say. That's cool. Now you've uh, mentioned these, these people, but you've brought in a great team to put together this book. I wonder if you could talk about how you found them and maybe you can describe the collaboration process as well. So I was terrified to talk to Nick. Nick Marenka <laughs> is our artist on the book. This was years ago. This is like 2019. I think it was Fan Expo 2019. No, not Fan Expo 2019. It was the Spring Show 2019. And he was there with this book called Voyager. 
which is a book about piracy, conspiracies, and all that stuff back in the 1600s and follows this young guy that travels from Ireland, not by his own will, of course, on a great wooden sailing ship of yore. And it was really, the art was just incredible. And I had the dead Roman story sort of kicking around, but I wasn't willing to do it with anyone who wasn't perfect for Mm -hmm. it. Uh, and it's because I wanted to sink a lot of money into it and make it look really good. And I wanted actually to have it as my follow up to another book that had already been greenlit that sort of imploded on the launch pad. And so I saw Nick and I was scared to talk to him. And my buddy Kalman Andrusovsky, uh, he said, That's the guy. Uh-huh. He's your guy. Talk to him. And so I bought the Voyager book and I had mentioned that I had a pitch. And I don't even know if Nick remembers me saying that to him. And then I think, but I, you got the vibe of like, oh, here we go, another pitch. <clears throat> and so then after the show was done, I read Voyager and then I emailed him and I said I had this story about Rome. And he was actually listening to a podcast about Rome at the time. And then he goes, he's, he was like, oh man, this is like serendipity. So mm. we agreed to meet up. And before we'd even left, we'd already mapped out the pitch pages. And then COVID hit, things changed, and we sent it out in like the end of 2021 and then sort of like worked on it all through 2022 because Nick was working on a few other things at the time. And then, yeah. And so when I was, when it got signed by Shadowline, Image Shadowline, Shadowline Image, whatever you want to say, Shadowline Image is what Jim would want me to say. So we'll say that. Okay. Uh, who's and he's been very supportive throughout. The, I'm very lucky to have somebody like Jim working with us. Uh, Jim Valentino, by the way. Okay. Um, and so he said, he goes, "Listen, kid, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to get all this stuff organized." Da 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 da. And I knew I needed help, and I messaged Allison because I think Allison is a phenomenal editor. She's also somebody that understands the way my brain works because our <laughs> brains work very similarly. Like we both have lots of ideas, but it's difficult to fight for, for your ideas because you feel guilty about fighting for your ideas. And she's very encouraging to say, no, you got to do it. So I messaged her. And what's great about that process was Allison was like, you don't have a lot of changes that you need to make with this book. So we really just tweaked a few things here and there. And she has been an invaluable resource. Nick needed help with colors, so we brought in Jose Villarubia, who's a gosh darn legend of the industry. And then Andrew Thomas came in to do the letters. And sure. yeah, that was like the whole process. The big thing, though, was getting to work with Nick. That was the big hurdle. And once Nick was on board, yeah. So that was that was the process right there. Was getting cool. Nick involved. That's neat. Good stuff. Now you've, you mentioned that at this show, the last issue of this arc comes out. Can you talk about any other upcoming projects that you Um, have on your plate? I can say I've got a project coming up with Blizzard, but I can't talk about it. All right. There's something happening with Blizzard that should be announced soon. And then I can talk about it a lot because I really like it. And then we're working on a second arc of Dead Romans, mm-hmm. and we're sort of waiting for a few things to fall into place. But the second arc is mapped out and ready to go. We're just sort of like waiting for a few things to happen. Um, and when that happens, we'll get into the nitty gritty details. But uh, it's a very cool continuation of the story in the sense that like Dead Romans is very large scale. Like it's a big large scale story with like lots of big set pieces and all that stuff. The second arc will be sort of the opposite. It'll be much smaller, much tighter, much closer and much more intimate. Uh, And I don't want anybody who hasn't read it to think that it's that you don't get to know any of the characters and there's no consistent arcs. There are, but in the next it's much. Yeah. It's that's, I don't want to get, give much more away than that. The one other thing I'm working on, it's not a comic though. It's a radio play. It's a Star Wars radio play. Yeah, you've, Mud- you've had success already with one. Are you doing another then? I'm doing a second season of it. Oh. And the second season actually comes out next Thursday. I remixed, revoiced, remastered the whole first season. Because when I did it the first time, I was sort of like learning as I went. By the time I finished, I felt like I had a very different product than what I had started with. So I revoiced, remixed the whole first season. So it had a very consistent feel and a consistent sound and it's going to flow seamlessly into the second season. Nice. And that is a project that I am so incredibly stoked on. I love it so much. And I cool. wish that I could like 
go on a national tour about it. Well, maybe you will. Who maybe. knows? Maybe. You never know. I want to switch gears a wee bit. Uh, I've been asking creators about the use of AI in comic book creation. It's it's all the all in the rave right now. But I want to get your take. Do you think that AI is helpful or harmful to comic book creation? Inevitably, my knee jerk reaction is going to say it's harmful. Uh, it's harmful because it's going to put people out of work. Because the thing that I see, this is what I foresee people using it for, is working on pitches, and they'll work on pitches with these AI programs, and then. That will impede a lot of younger artists or artists that are inexperienced trying to break in and working with other people that are new. It'll deny them that opportunity. That's one thing that I see happening. And everybody's got their own take. But invariably, I think that it's going to put artists out of work and it's going to reduce the amount of work for artists, especially things like concept art, et cetera. You're going to see a lot of these these opportunities fade away. And it's frustrating because... It's invariably only going to create average repetitive content. Like that's all it's going to do. It's not going to innovate. It's not going to change. It's not going to create new things. And there's an argument that you could make to counter that saying that a lot of stuff that comes out does have the vibe of repetitiveness already anyways. And I think that you are going to see a lot of generic mediocre product get pushed because it's cheap and it's going to be sold more cheaply than stuff that's created by actual content creators and artists. And it's frustrating because there's a lot of people that just aren't going to care. And, and I think that like give the consumer a lot of credit. Absolutely. The fans are the fans for a reason. But it's the casual fans that I think are not going to be informed about what it is they're doing, and then they're just going to get it. It's sort of like when you've got two products on the shelf, okay? You've got two toothbrushes on the shelf, and you've got one toothbrush that is like the best toothbrush ever, and it costs $8. And then you've got the next toothbrush, which is only going to last you like six months, but it's only $1 and it's not very good, et cetera. That person is going to, uh, like most people are going to take that $1 toothbrush and are not going to appreciate the comforting bristles of the $8 toothbrush, you know? That's not to say nobody's going to buy the $8 toothbrush. They will. But the $1 toothbrush is going to be very appealing to people who don't understand the jobs that they're taking by buying it, you know? Right, and I think right. that's frustrating. And I think that also music is a great analogy and I've used this before if you're taking samples of music and putting it in a new single you got to pay for it right like that's licensed work yeah. yet all these artists are having their work stolen and used to create new things and they're not getting a sample fee and they should it's theft period end of story it is okay well said well said well thank you for that fred before we wrap up i want to ask you do you have a website where you recommend people go to find out about your current and your future projects i do Actually, well, I got like a portfolio, like an online portfolio, but that's mostly to get me work freelance writing and stuff. But I also have like I'm on Twitter, and Blue Sky and Threads and Instagram and all the rest. And it's just look for Fearless Fred and, and you'll find me at Fearless underscore Fred. Go that route. Cool. Well, Fred, those are all the questions I have for you. But I want to ask, is there anything I didn't ask you? that you want to get across in this interview that my radio play is really good. And if you like the comic, you'll like the radio play and vice versa. And if you're a star Wars fan, I can't see you not liking mud 79. Cause it's got that vibe. And also look, because I worked on this for like three years ago, I think somebody at Disney might be listening to it mm. because there are some scenes from mud 79 that have been recreated verbatim in the shows. Now it's possible that these are just ideas floating around in the ether, but in the sake of vanity, I'm going to assume somebody is listening. Thanks to Fred for the chat. You can discover more about Fred on Instagram at fearless underscore Fred. And thanks to you for listening to the true North country comics podcast. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to and like this podcast on Apple podcasts and Google podcasts. And please check out the TrueNorthCountryComics.com website. 
Jarth Country Comics is now on YouTube. Please like and subscribe to that video channel and hit the notification button. You can follow along with True North Country Comics on most social media sites. Please send your feedback to John at truenorthcountrycomics.com. If you want to help the site and the podcast, please consider supporting the effort by chipping in at ko-fi.com slash truenorthcountrycomics. Your patronage is greatly appreciated. Thanks for listening, and come back soon for another episode. Bye for now. Truth Country Comics Podcast is copyright Truth Country Comics, copyright 2023.